So today um, I'd like to speak a little bit about heart to heart issues in children with aortopathies. Um, much of my um, talk will focus on uh, Marfan syndrome and Lloyd's Deed syndrome. Um, but as you've heard from the previous talks, um, many of the aortopathy conditions have one thing in common, which is aortic dilation. And many of our aims in terms of medical and surgical management are to try and prevent um, progression of aortic enlargement as well as to treat it before um, uh, dissection would occur. Um, next slide, please. And so the learning objectives today are to review some of the common cardiovascular findings that we see in children with these connective tissue disorders, to uh, speak a little bit about the imaging techniques and decipher what the Z-score means, uh, because that's a little bit different in children than it is in adults when we follow along with aortic enlargement and how we um, use that information for clinical decision-making. We'll speak a bit about uh, management, medical therapy, when it's time to do surgical intervention, and activity restrictions have already been mentioned. I'm going to leave most of the details about that to my colleague, Erin Olson, who will be speaking about exercise a little bit later this morning. Next slide. So starting off with Marfan syndrome, uh, this was initially described in 1896 by a pediatrician, Dr. Antoine Bernard-Jean Marfan, who described these features of very long, spindly, thin limbs in a five-year-old who had other skeletal abnormalities, including um, scoliosis, abnormality skew feet, and ankle valgus. Next slide. It wasn't until later um, in 1914 that an ophthalmologist by the name of Borger noted an association between dislocation of the lens and skeletal abnormalities. Next slide. And then later in 1943, with imaging uh, being uh, more commonly available, aortic aneurysms and dissections were reported in single cases. Uh, then in 1991, next slide, um, the fibrillin-1 mutation uh, was sort of the cement that pulled together all these clinical findings of dislocated lens, skeletal abnormalities, scoliosis, uh, upper lower extremity um, discrepancies, um, and aortic aneurysms uh, that was described as Marfan syndrome. Next slide. Um, later in 2005, uh, Bart Loys and Hal Dietz described similar findings in a group of children uh, that had overlapping features with Marfan syndrome. However, the, this group of individuals had more aggressive and diffuse vascular disease with aneurysms that were occurring not only in the aorta, but more peripherally in the, in the head, neck vessels, as well as the abdominal and pelvic neck, uh, vessels. Congenital heart abnormalities were also common in this group with patent ductus arteriosus, bicuspid aortic valve, and aortic uh, atrial septal defects uh, being quite common. Next slide. One of the things that, um, that um, is very uh, prevalent in Lois Deed syndrome, also in Marfan syndrome, but, but more so I would say in Lois Deed syndrome, is an increase in arterial tortuosity. And you can see here um, in the aorta on the um, left side of the screen uh, that it takes almost like a C to curve within the abdomen. And all the head and neck vessels that come off of the aortic arch almost have a corkscrew appearance to them. There has been some research uh, from Shane Morris's group that has actually suggested that the more tortuous the vessels are, uh, the more the likelihood um, or pro of progression and also um, severity of aortic aneurysms and cardiovascular manifestations. Next slide, please. Um, Lois Dietz also has um, other um, abnormalities that are um, that um, are unique to it. Um, a, a bifid uvula, you can see here. Typically, the uvula, which hangs out in the down in the back of the throat, um, is single. Um, but in individuals with Lois Dietz syndrome, it tends to have this notched or W sort of appearance. Um, also, craniosynostosis or some fusion of the different bones within the head uh, can be uh, prevalent as as well as structural abnormalities of both the brain and the spine. Next slide. Um, there is a um, group of genes, TGF uh, mutations that are um, uh, go along with Lois Dietz or cause Lois Dietz syndrome. These are the TGF beta R1 uh, and 2, TGF beta 2, 3, and SMAD3 and 2 genes. 
Next slide. One thing that is common in both these abnormalities um, as, or syndromes, as well as other um, erotopathies, is that um, one gene affects many of the phenotypic characteristics that are seen. There can be, with one mutation in several um, family members, uh, significant phenotypic vari variation in how uh, the presentation is, is present. Um, there's a high penetrance, meaning that people that have the mutation are very likely to have the signs and symptoms of the syndrome. They are progressive over time, and early diagnosis in both, um, in both uh, pathologies, as well as the other aortopathies, allows for prevention. Next slide. I'd like to change gears here and speak a little bit about the cardiac anatomy. And I think it's always important before we start talking about aortic aneurysms and mitral valve prolapse to have a little bit of a baseline knowledge about cardiac anatomy and physiology. Typically, blue blood that is depleted of oxygen returns back to the right side of the heart and is pumped from the right ventricle out the pulmonary artery to the lungs where it picks up oxygen. It then returns to the left side of the heart here, full of oxygen to the left ventricle and is then pumped out the aorta. The left ventricle is a high pressure pump that pumps it, that blood out the aorta to all the different vessels, organs of the body. So it is a high pressure chamber as is the aorta. Next slide. When we talk about um, Marfan syndrome, Lois-Dietz syndrome, some of the other aortopathies, aortic enlargement is a key feature. And you can see here a normal aorta in the outside of the heart and to the right here, a heart with an enlarged aorta or an aortic aneurysm. And as previously noted, depending on the progressive rate of the aortic aneurysm or the size of the aortic aneurysm determines how we manage it both medically and or surgically. Next slide, please. So some of the common cardiovascular findings that we see in uh, Lois-Dietz and Marfan syndrome are progressive aortic enlargement leading to aortic aneurysms. These can potentially dissect and could potentially rupture, which may be fatal. So a key element of our management is regular surveillance to make sure that we try and treat to, to slow progression and that we intervene um, at an elective point rather than having to do it emergently. Additional cardiac findings are mitral valve prolapse or floppiness of the mitral valve leaflets. This can sometimes result in the leaflets not coapting or coming together efficiently so that the valve can develop leakage over time or regurgitation. Likewise, the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart can also prolapse and leak. Um, one of the other features that can develop over time in some individuals is left ventricular enlargement and dysfunction or cardiomyopathy. We already spoke a little bit about arterial tortuosity, um, and then peripheral artery aneurysms are a key feature and very common in the Lois uh, Dietz cohort. Next slide. So regular imaging surveillance is key for monitoring clinical decision making in individuals with aortopathies. Typically, echocardiography is a really good tool for following individuals on a yearly basis or every six months, depending on, on how um, uh, what the severity of their findings are. Um, echo gives us really good visualization of the heart, the aortic root, the, the blood vessels that are close to the heart. The image quality, however, depends on age, whether the patient is cooperative or not in the pediatric population, body size, Sometimes pectus abnormalities of the chest wall can um, have an effect um, or, uh, on the image quality as well as motion. Um, the advantage of echo is that it's widely available. It's easy to perform and well tolerated, and also the cost is is lower than CT or MRI. This is really good a good tool for initial diagnosis and for ongoing management. CT, on the other hand, uh, allows for excellent visualization of all the blood vessels for a, an evaluation of tortuosity and dissection. It's widely available, quick and well tol tolerated. However, it does use radiation. This is less, less of a problem now with the modern scanners, but still does have some exposure risk. Um, CT is typically used uh, for those, if, for those um, conditions or situations in which there is a concern for dissection. 
I would say that MRI has really gained some popularity. MRI is, um, allows us to have a 3D evaluation or visualization of the aortic root. And sometimes because, you know, just small um, changes in the angle of imaging on an echocardiogram, because it's a two-dimensional image, can really make um, a significant um, change um, or make a difference in when we look at aortic measurements and z-scores. So MRI, when there's a concern that the echo is not giving us adequate data, or for example, if we're starting to get close to a situation where we need to make decisions regarding surgical intervention, MRI, because it provides a three-dimensional image, is actually um, the gold standard uh, for visualization of the aorta. Uh, this is best used for long-term follow-up in older individuals and also gives us information, for example, in systemic arterial disease of the peripheral vessels in the brain and in the rest of the body where echo may not be adequate. Next slide. So usually in reality, what we use is a combination of imaging modalities. Um, important points related to imaging surveillance are that the measurements really need to be made in a consistent fashion. Um, so it's important that the imager or the person who's reading the echocardiogram looks at previous studies to make sure that there's no change in the angle or the location where the measurements are made. Preferably, these, these studies are done at a single center that has lots of experience in connective tissue disorders. And again, really important to compare those measurements to prior studies to, and to follow trends over time. As Dr. Buber mentioned, in adults, medical and surgical decision-making are based on absolute measurements or measurements that are indexed to body surface area. In growing children, however, there are limitations to using absolute dimensions because over time, just as the body grows, the aorta of a child grows. Next slide. So herein um, come the um, value or the importance of z-scores. As we see on this graph, aortic di um, diameter is here on the left and on the lower um, axis is body surface area. And as a child grows, um, their body grows, but not only does their body grow, but their aorta grows. So how do we index um, and how do we determine whether the aorta is growing in proportion to the body or not? Next slide, please. This is where we use z-scores. Z-scores are actually um, indexed, um, the absolute measurement uh, to body surface area, and that takes into account both weight and height of the child. So if you see here z-score, age of the child here, as age goes up, the z-score kind of goes up and down, up and down here and there. But if you look at the general trend where to grow a line through this graph, you can see that it stays pretty similar. So if the z-score stays the same, or similar over time, that means that the aorta is actually growing in proportion to the rest of the body. The z-score is a standard deviation above the mean or the median for a, um, a group of children at the same age, the same so body size. And so we have normative values for these z-scores, um, but most importantly, we use this rather than the absolute dimension to follow aortic growth and trends within children because their body is continuing to grow. So a z-score in children of greater than seven is uncommon. We sometimes will see z-scores that are higher than this in individuals with early onset Marfan syndrome um, and certain uh, mutations that occur within an area of the gene that um, leads to more progressive and, uh, dis and severe disease. Uh, in growing children, despite stable z-scores, the aorta, as I mentioned, continues to grow. And in most individuals, we expect the aortic z-score to stay in the same area or to slowly increase over many years. Next slide, please. So our medical management, as I previously mentioned, is really aimed at slowing aortic growth. And as Dr. Buber had mentioned, we do this by the use of beta blockers. Um, this includes um, different medications within the same class, including propanolol for younger children, atenolol, metoprolol. We also use angiotensin II receptor blockers that really work within the tissue um, to block receptors that um, are important in blood pressure control. 
These include losartan and herbisartan. Other modes of management are exercise restriction, but again, um, now the pendulum is swinging from really having restricted individuals with these connective tissue disorders to really recognizing the, that some degree of exercise and physical activity is good. We'll get into more details with that a little bit later. Um, and as previously mentioned, there will be a webinar about this um, a little bit later. And I think Stephanie provided some information on that. Surgical in from intervention um, may be needed at some point. We prefer obviously to do this on an elective basis rather than um, emergently. And then other supportive ser services um, that aren't necessarily cardiovascular but may be helpful in terms of providing optimizing eyesight, um, you know, uh, pain management, um, orthotics, et cetera, um, that, that have to do with other uh, manifestations outside of cardiac. Next slide, please. Uh, so the beta blockers um, work by blocking the effects of adrenaline or epinephrine. They decrease sheer stress on the aortic walls and over time lower the heart rate as well as blood pressure. Sometimes, especially older individuals may feel a little bit tired out when they start beta blockers because of the lowering the heart rate, but this really doesn't seem to be a problem in children. Um, there are contraindications to the use of beta blockers in those that have reactive airway disease or asthma because they can constrict the bronchioles, but this doesn't tend to be something um, that, that causes um, any adverse side effects in individuals without asthma. Um, angiotensin receptor blockers, losartan or bisartan block the action of angiotensin II and relax the blood vessels and lower blood pressures, but don't have any effects on heart rate. Both of these medications have been used in children for a long time uh, with very low um, side effects. Um, uh, the tri Marfan trial came out uh, in 2014 and over three years looked at over 600 individuals, um, children between the ages of six months and 18 years of age to try and see if there was any difference between the use of atenolol versus losartan in terms of slowing uh, aortic growth. What the trial found uh, was that the estimated rate of change in aortic root diameter uh, was no different between those individuals that were treated with atenolol, which is seen here in the red line, and losartan, which is seen here in the blue line. Likewise, the rate of change in aortic Z-score was no different um, in terms of whether atenolol or losartan was used. When uh, the data was looked at, was analyzed per subgroups, so whether age made a difference or aortic root size or Z-score made a difference, past use of beta blockers or gender, there was no difference again in the subgroup analysis of atenolol benefits versus losartan benefits. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, both medications were had very low um, uh, incidence of side effects and very low adverse effects, which included dissection, surgery, or death during the trial period. Uh, what was what uh, finding one finding that was um, of value from the study was that the estimated change in aortic Z score seemed to be most uh, most beneficial um, or have the most effect when it was used in younger children. So as you can see here, for both atenolol and for losartan, at younger ages, it tended to have a higher um, decrease in uh, Z score rate of change. So the conclusions of the trial were that there was no real significant difference in the rate of aortic root dilation between atenolol and losartan over three years. Treatment effects really did not differ according to pre-specified subgroups. Both drugs are well tolerated and losartan and atenolol may be more effective in reducing aortic Z-score changes in younger subjects. So our typical um, algorithm when we use medical therapy for Marfan syndrome in children is similar to the one in, in uh, Boston Children's. So um, I've given a talk before with uh, my colleague, Ron Lacro. And so um, this slide, I wanna give him the benefit um, for sharing with me. Um, there, when children have no aortic uh, root dilation, uh, we tend to speak to the parents about, um, you know, have sort of a combined decision 
decision-making process of whether uh, they feel they want to start the medications uh, prophylactically or preventatively at that point in time, or whether they want to hold off until we show some dilation or some abnormal um, dimensions of the aortic um, root. Um, for those with mild aortic uh, di root dilation, um, that's a Z-score of greater than two and a half or so and less than five. A beta blocker um, is used or an angiotensin receptor blocker. So we use single um, medication therapy. And then with more severe or progressive aortic dilation, um, we, we will use combination therapy with both a, both a beta blocker and angiotensin receptor blocker. That ARB may include either Losartan or Herbisartan. There's a study that's come out of the UK that suggests that the possibility that that herbisartan may be um, better than losartan, but both are of the same drug group. And I think the importance here is that combination therapy um, seems to have more benefit um, when this um, aortic root dilation is more severe. So one of the things that came out a few years ago um, was from the FDA was that the use of fluoroquinolones or those antibiotics that end in floxacin uh, was shown to increase the likelihood of experiencing aortic aneurysm growth or dissection in individuals that had genetic aortic conditions. These are commonly prescribed antibiotics, uh, typically uh, for skin infections, sometimes urinary tract infections. Avalox, you can see here, moxifloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, and ofloxacin. The common tying factor here is floxacin. So typically when we see our patients in, in our cardiac genetics clinic, um, we recommend against these and to try to, rather than have the patient have to remember all of these different medications, we put them in the allergies um, so that that way it's flagged in the chart and in their electronic medical record, um, which is usually, especially now with Epic, um, in, um, more you know, available to people even when they're not cared for just in one location. Next slide, please. Management surgical intervention is typically um, dependent on gene mutation. If it's a more um, severe gene or a more rapidly progressive gene mutation, then surgical intervention may need to be undertaken sooner. Um, in children, um, it will, in adults uh, with Marfan syndrome, as previously noted, an aortic diameter of greater than five centimeters or in children, a Z-score of greater than eight um, would be when we would start thinking about surgical intervention and repair. For Lois Dietz, again, those dimensions are smaller. And most importantly, in children, we try to get to an aortic valve annulus that's at least 18 to 20 millimeters, so that in the event that the aortic valve needs to be replaced, we have a size um, that that's, you know, we can put the biggest size and put in a larger size um, annulus or a prosthetic valve in that place. Also in children, um, aortic uh, root growth rate is important. So those that are greater than uh, 10 millimeters per year in children. And if there are any associated cardiac findings, such as progressive aortic insufficiency, mitral valve that needs repair, that may push us to do the aortic root replacement a little bit sooner rather than later. Family history is also important. And tortuosity, at least at this point, has not entered into our decision-making here, uh, but may um, have some impact in terms of what the severity of presentation is. Next slide, please. Um, exercise, again, what type of exercise is safe? How much exercise is safe? We don't always have the right answer because we don't really have outcomes data in this area to guide us. We have in the past typically erred on the conservative side, but I have to say that there are many benefits as Dr. Buber pointed out, and I'm sure as my colleague, Dr. Olson will point out later in his talk, um, there are many benefits, um, not only cardiovascular for exercise, and thus activity is really important, physical activity on a daily basis. Um, and some, some more discussion about that will take place a little bit later in Dr. Olson's talk. Next slide, please. Um, really important is to share health information. So all of my patients, we talk about having a medical alert bracelet that has information about their diagnosis, their risk for dissection, any medications or allergies they may have. Um, key also these days is to have mobile apps that have our electronic me uh, medical information. And the EMR is really important now with sharing of information between different hospitals and different medical systems. <laughs> 
And finally, in summary, cardiovascular complications before mo both Marfan syndrome and Lloyd's disease may be life-threatening. So it's really important to have early and accurate diagnosis. Surveillance and management, I, I say, is really key and needs to take into account a child's growth. Awareness, regular surveillance, appropriate medical therapy, and surgical intervention when needed can really aid in improving long-term outcomes and is crucial in saving lives. So thank you um, very much. And uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Luch. I was going to tell you to stop sharing, but I guess I'm doing that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So let's go to these uh, these questions for children and heart issues. Um, what should be done for a, a baby as young as four months old who has a Marfan diagnosis? Um, what should they do now? What should, what should they be looking towards um, in terms of medical management in the next few years? Uh, thank you for that for that uh, question. I would say um, typically um, with Marfan syndrome, it, I would say if it's in a baby, it tends to be a little bit more progressive and early onset um, than when we discover it or diagnosis or it presents um, later sort of in life or teenage years. Um, I think that that most important thing is to connect with a multidisciplinary group, um, that meaning cardiac uh, cardiologists, geneticists, neurodevelopmental specialists, orthopedic specialists, all the subspecialists that can help you and help your child in terms of getting the care that they need. Um, in terms of imaging and echocardiogram, regular surveillance, which is usually, if not every six, you know, at the beginning, then six months, and then if things are stable on a yearly basis. And then the use of medications, as I mentioned earlier, um, is a conversation that you can have with your provider in terms of if there is no aortic dilation, then you may hold off on medications and then continue to follow. And if the aorta becomes dilated at that point in time, determine whether or not um, a beta blocker or an ARB is uh, the, the medical therapy of choice. Great. I hope that answers the question that you were looking for. Okay, thank you. If it doesn't, they will come back and ask you know, follow up or ask Ken, which is totally fine. Again, if your questions are not answered here or you have other questions, definitely go to Jan at marthan.org slash ask. Um, so here's a question. This is kind of interesting. You know, a lot of people who have children with Marthan or Veg or Louis Dietz, they do travel to people like you, to Shane Morris in Houston, Ron Lackrow and Al Dietz um, for their like an annual um, exam or annual checkup. Um, and so they have a trusted advisor on their team, but they also use somebody locally um, mm -hmm. or regular because you need both, right? Um, right. And this person saying you know, the local cardiologist who's a non-expert really, just general pediatric, always checks the aorta and mitral valve through echocardiogram. This is for a little girl with beds. Is that the right thing? Should they be doing it? And can you talk about the coordination please between like the local cardiologist and somebody such as yourself? Well, I would say, so thanks for, um, you know, J for mentioning Jan. Um, Jan has been really great. She does reach out to all of us. And when there are pediatric questions, I don't think I'm the only one or Peter's the only one. We get um, emails from her all the time um, from parents wondering, you know, and just wanting a little bit of, I guess, a overview or a second opinion. Um, I would say that all of us are available through, through Jan and through the Marfan Foundation uh, when there are questions. Um, there also, we see um, individuals at the Marfan conf annual conference. And so there's an opportunity to be seen there um, to just have some input in terms of medical care and advice. Um, so I, I think we are pretty readily available. And if your provider would like to reach out to any of us, uh, we'd be more than happy to talk if they have any questions to go over things with them. 